So, I'm Mark Westerby. I'm speaking on behalf of the Millthorpe Fund Committee. Um, Fred Millthorpe was one of three foundation professors in biological sciences at Macquarie. This was during the 1970s, mainly. Um, if you go to the first year labs and look in the posters in the window, you'll find a, a picture of, of Fred there. He was um, born in the countryside in Hilston in western New South Wales. Uh, went to Sydney Uni and later on to London University. Worked with the New South Wales Department of Agriculture and also with uh, the WAIT, which is a very famous agricultural research institute in Adelaide. In 1954, he was recruited to the chair of agricultural botany, as it was then called, at Nottingham University in England. And he stayed there for um, 13 years and built a worldwide reputation, absolutely, <coughs> for research on, on crop physiology, meaning plant physiology, but done at a field scale, not on individual plants in growth chambers. Um, and then he came back to Australia, to Macquarie University. He continued with the crop physiology research, and in parallel with that, he led the development of environmental science programs in what was then a new university. Um, and that combination is important. I think it's important to get your head around the idea that growing crops and um, taking care of the environment uh, don't have to be in opposition to each other. And integrating them at a landscape scale is, is, uh, is the way of the future. Um, he had lots and lots of PhD students, often working at agriculture experiment stations, horticulture experiment stations. Lots of those students went on to become leaders in CSIRO or in ag departments or in universities in Australia and also in quite a few overseas countries. Um, the Millthorpe Fund was established in Fred's memory and we're really grateful to the Millthorpe family for their support and especially to uh, Bruce Millthorpe, if you want to give us a, a wave, Bruce, uh, who's able to be here today. Um, <laughs> It, it is um, a public lecture, and this year it's also being given to the first-year biology students. So it's a great pleasure to welcome our, our speaker, Professor Ian Chubb. He's been Chief Scientist of Australia for, still is, um, uh, for the past two years. Um, this doesn't mean he actually sort of leads an army of, of scientists working on anything in particular. Uh, rather, his job is policy advice about how Australia's research should be organised, uh, what the national research priorities should be, um, that kind of thing. And just as important as that, um, he acts as a champion for science and for using evidence rather than superstition and arm waving in the Australian community uh, and in government generally. Before he was chief scientist, um, he was Vice-Chancellor of the Australian National University for 10 years and for that of Flinders University for six years. And for uh, those of you who may not be familiar with university jargon yet, Vice-Chancellor means Chief Executive, Boss, whatever. Um, before that, he was a neuroscience researcher of considerable distinction. Um, before that, he grew up on a farm in Victoria. I was reading an article about him which quoted him as saying this about the landscape where he grew up. You look at the world around you and you wonder why things are like they are. Well, that's a bit of a vague question, maybe. Um, why do ants do what they do in the way they do? How well do they do what they do? Let me tell you that all three of those questions about ants are very good questions indeed, uh, as it happens some of the leading ecology researchers in our department have been working on them. If you sit on a rock, uh, pretty much anywhere in Australia and eat your lunch and look at what's going on in the ecosystem around you, um, it's impressive how much ant traffic there is and how it relates to a lot of the other things. And ants have a sort of a nursery book reputation for efficient organisation and hard work, but this isn't actually totally justified if you actually watch individual ants. They dither around quite a lot and lose track of what they were doing. Um, but anyway, ants are probably not mainly what... Um, Prof Chubb is lecturing about today, but he may well be lecturing about what would be good questions. So over to you.
Okay. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction and thank you uh, for coming out on this uh, remarkably cold uh, Sydney day for a person who comes from Canberra, I can tell you, uh, we know about cold. Um, it's an honour to be here, to have uh, been invited to uh, deliver this lecture. And uh, it is true that I grew up on a farm and I wondered uh, why the world was what the world was as I saw it as a four-year-old or five-year-old. And uh, I did an interview yesterday with the Australian and they said to me, well, you know, the usual. Uh, even at my age, they still ask you, who was your most inspirational teacher? And, um, and I can remember one. And uh, his name was Mr Honey. And he was my first teacher in a single teacher country school with one room and six rows and 20 kids. And uh, one of the things that you learned from that, uh, because he had to give you something to do when you're in grade, grade one and then he would move on to grade two, three, four, five, six and come back again. One of the things that you had to learn was that you had to be uh, a bit self-motivated. Uh, what he had to do was to send different grades outside to you know, play in the sun or do whatever we did and uh, he would ask you to observe things. And I guess that the thing that stuck with me through most of my life has been a, a degree of self-motivation and uh, a degree of inquisitiveness that I think uh, was developed as a nearly five-year-old, uh, who up until the time that he went to school, it was him and his dog and what nature provided, plus a few adults who you know, looked after you, but you didn't uh, have all the means of communication with adults. And so you, uh, you wonder about things. And I think one of the great things about science is that when you wonder about things, you can actually do science to try to get some of the answers, some part of the way to an answer, uh, to be able to explain why ants do what they do or when they do it or how they do it or how organised or disorganised they might be. And you might think that that's only about ants, but it's not. It's about how groups, how individuals contribute to group, all of those sorts of things that emerge from research like that. So I do get a bit irritated from time to time when I see people sort of marching off and saying, well, you know, why would we do research in such and such an area because it's got no immediate and obvious benefit. But when you look back at the research that's been done over in Australia and in the world for quite a long time now, uh, you realise that a lot of the pieces that were out there and seemingly not connected begin to connect as you understand more as you realise things better, as you interpret old information better, as you do new things and understand new things. So since most of you in this room are interested in science, doing science, studying science, will be scientists, you will also apply the skills and talents and the methods that you use by studying science to a whole variety of things. And I say to the students in the room, don't let people tell you that because you study this particular scientific discipline or that one, that that's all you can ever do, because it's not true. What you have is a method, an approach, a way of learning, a way of understanding, a way of thinking about things, which become highly refined through an education in the sciences and can be applied to a variety of problems. And the world needs more people who think like that. So the world needs more people who think like scientists. Most of the problems that confront us in humanity, as humanity, will actually have some element of science at the core of either the solution or the way we manage it or the way we mitigate it or the way we adapt to it. It won't be science in isolation. We need the humanities and social sciences. We need a community that is aware and alert and prepared and we need to understand that community. But science will be an element in most of them, and I can't think of one of the great global challenges that doesn't have science as an integral part to its solution or to its mitigation or management or how we adapt uh, to whatever it might be. Now, um, early last week, I heard uh, some of my staff uh, back in my office talking about black-eyed peas and uh, I thought it was a bit strange. Never heard of it before except as food. 
And then I heard them going on to describe how awesome the sort of black-eyed peas actually were, and I'd never heard them talk about food like that before. Um, and uh, then, of course, I asked, "Was that why are you saying that?" Oh, they said. And then they put on this tone of voice that the young use to explain something to the elderly. <laughs> you know, with extreme patience, they slow the pace down, they emphasise each syllable, and they say, "Well." Ian, you appear not to understand that the Black Eyed Peas is a band. And I didn't understand that. I still thought it was food. And, um, but uh, they told me that a member of the Black Eyed Peas band, Will I Am, they've instructed me to pronounce it. I would have called it William otherwise, but um, Will I Am recently donated £500,000 to the Prince's Trust charity in the UK. And what did he do that for? He directed them to use it and use the money on science lessons for young children. And he said when he donated it, and I quote him, I wanted to donate, donate this money so if there is a kid somewhere in the ghetto or undeserving communi uh, unders underserved community in London, people just like me, instead of telling he or she to play sports, let's encourage them to do science or mathematics. I have no doubt that a kid from Brixton or East London can create something that changes the world with the Prince's Trust. And I thought to myself, well, I'll go and buy their CDs just to make sure they get a bit of royalty flow. Um, I might be the only one who buys their CDs. I don't know about the rest of you in this room. But, <laughs> but, uh, but, but I think somebody who thinks like that and earns money in whatever way they earn it, but who thinks in that really quite profound way, but but in a way that will help people overcome their disadvantage, I think deserves our support too. Because what he said was something that we all understand, it's something we all uh, share. Now a good number of you today I know are studying biology, uh, first year biology at least. And it is of course a discipline with a very broad application uh, in the Australian context. And biology along with chemistry has a long standing and fruitful relationship with agriculture and agriculture is the area that I've been asked to pay a particular attention to today, and I will do that, uh, because Australia's agricultural section really matters to this country. We need it to be strong, and we need it to be sustainable. Uh, not least, we need it to be those things in order to feed ourselves. Now, we talk about food security often in this country, uh, but don't be misled by any narrow definition. The importance of food security extends well beyond food itself, and that's something I'll come back to in a minute. But let me turn first to the loss of capacity in our agricultural sector. It's true for both the farmers that produce food and fibre and the scientists working to help them do it better. So first of all, like all of us in this room actually, some of us just apparently a bit faster than others, we're all getting older. Um, from 1976 to 2001, the number of farmers in their 20s in Australia declined by more than 60%. So these days, the average age of Australian farmers is 53, which is 14 years above the national average for other occupations. So it's, it's an ageing lot of farmers, and of course, in part, it's because the farmers are getting older, but it's also in part because more and more people are leaving the sector. And last, in, in 2011, 18,000 people left the agricultural sector in Australia. So it begs the question, in 10, 20, 50 years, who's going to grow the crops or raise the livestock or do the research that will help them do it all better? And unfortunately in Australia, or unfortunately for Australia, although perhaps fortunately for some of you, uh, only about 0.5% of university students take agricultural science in the, these days. In 2010, we had 743 graduates in the agricultural sciences, and in that same year, approximately 4,500 jobs were advertised that required agricultural sciences. So farmers need scientists to keep providing the new knowledge that they need to do things differently and to do things better. And it's pretty clear, I think, that we're not producing enough and won't produce enough uh, of those sciences, scientists once the present uh, cohort works its way through the uh, uh, working age profile. And that's where hopefully some of you might come in. The fact is that we need some of you to be thinking about working in agricultural science. Australians should be adding to agricultural science's global bank of knowledge 
because we need that knowledge to draw from, to draw down, so that we can produce, produce more and more food of the right sort in a context that will change all the time. And that's been our story so far. Science has already had a major impact on agriculture. The, the results have been, I think we could really say, not unlike the black-eyed peas, really awesome. Um, since the introduction of the Green Revolution crops, for example, global crop production increased from 1.84 billion tonnes in 1960 to 4.38 by 2007. So it's a very substantial increase. More than a doubling of yield, but it stemmed from only an 11% increase on the amount of agricultural land that was actually being used. So for those of you uh, who don't know the story, <coughs> look up Norman Borlake, who was credited with starting the Green Revolution, because he developed a high-yield, disease-resistant wheat. And when it was introduced to many developing countries, it is said to have saved more than a billion people from starvation. And when he accepted the Nobel Prize in 1970, uh, Norman said, and I quote him exactly, so this is what he said, we are dealing with two opposing forces, the scientific power of food production and the biologic power of human reproduction. Man has made amazing progress recently in his potential mastery of these two contending powers. Science, invention and technology have given him materials and methods for increasing his food supply substantially. But I put it to you that we can't uh, take our ability to produce food of sufficient quantity or of sufficient quality for granted. Food security, as we call it, is a global issue and Australia is playing its part, uh, primarily, of course, through primary production. We're a major food trading nation. We export around 70% of the food we produce. And, of course, Asia is our biggest market, with China the most significant importing country. But by 2050, global demand for food is projected to increase by 70% from what it was uh, only five years ago. And of course, where is the greatest growth expected? And not surprisingly, uh, it is expected in, um, uh, our doorstep, on our doorstep in Asia and particularly in China. So what will they want more of? Well, the projections are that they'll want more fruit and vegetables, followed by meat and cereals according to the projections that are now current. And of course they're changing a bit and we often read and hear about the fact that as the uh, uh, circumstances of the population, the large populations in these countries change, then of course they're changing their diets too. So there's an increasing uh, um, uh, demand uh, for Australian beef, for example, in uh, countries in our region. But Australian beef takes a massive amount of water to produce by the kilogram. And so in Australia we've got to recognise that we can't just continue doing a bit more of what we've always done and tinker at the margins. We're going to have to do things differently if we're actually going to not just survive, not just sustain, but also to prosper in this sort of environment. Currently Australia produces enough food to contribute to the diets of about 60 million people. And uh, that's around a bit under 1% of the world's population and 2% of the population of Asia. But when we talk about contribute to the diets of 60 million people, it's what we mean. It does not mean that we produce all their diet. And one of the things that we've got to recognise uh, as Australians or as people who are operating in Australia at the present moment and wherever it is we go back to work, either to a home country or, or as Australians to work in another country, we have to remember that we are contributing. There's a lot of talk about Australia being the food bowl of Asia. If you take that literally, it is inconceivable that we could be the food bowl of Asia. We don't have the capacity to be the food bowl of Asia if that means that we provide the diets for everybody. But it doesn't mean that we can't be significant contributors to the diets of many people in the world and in our region and grow it from about 60, 60 million to uh, some larger figure. It's also been estimated that Australian know-how, so the scientific expertise that Australians take uh, when they go to work in another country particularly, um, or through the applications of their science and technology within Australia, but Australian know-how contributes to the diets of about 400 million people in the world. So already through scientific effort, through scientific use, 
but through the applications and development, or the development first and the applications of real science, not arm waving, arm flapping science, but real science, or pseudoscience, but real science, we, we are contributing already to the diets of 400 million people. But don't forget the figures that I talked about earlier. 700 odd students enrolled in agricultural sciences, 4,300 jobs advertised, there's a gap there. We've got to do something about filling the gap if we want to be a bigger contributor than we already are. So the, it's, our contributions have been important and a lot of them of course come through our aid program. A couple of years ago I was asked by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research to chair a panel looking at aid funding for research by Australian institutions, particularly in agriculture and medicine. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Australian government a few years ago uh, took a decision to increase the aid budget substantially. It reduced the number of aid recipient countries since some of the countries we were, we were giving aid to, for example, were able to build high-speed railway lines between their capital cities, not something we've yet been able to do more than talk about in Australia. Um, but uh, we were giving them aid and eventually the, the aid budget had to be rationalised. The number of aid recipient countries was reduced from somewhere in the middle 90s to uh, the high teens and the, uh, it was decided that the best and biggest bang for the buck would be if we focused on agriculture and on health. So we did this, uh, um, uh, the panel met, formed, framed a strategy that said first of all we should do a few things. One is find out what the countries that we were offering it to actually wanted. So it wasn't about saying, uh, you know, here I am, I'm an Australian scientist and I know what's good for you. It's about saying, hello, I'm an Australian scientist, I've got some knowledge and skills that may be a benefit to you in areas where you have need. Where do you have need? And uh, that would be a good way to do it. And we also tried to emphasise that these should not be short-term issues. We need longer-term investment because what you have to do is you have to leave behind residual capacity. And instead of just going along, doing a research project, changing the way you get rice to grow on dry ground uh, and then leaving again, whilst that is important and will probably always be a part, it's the longer term legacy that you lead that's an important part or should be an important part of an aid program. So we tried to wrap it up and say, well look, whilst clearly there's no substitute for food, um, we, we need also to change the local conditions. So you needed to be able to develop, as it were, a local market so the farmer could produce food, surplus food could be sold, um, roads and infrastructure could be developed to get it to market if that were the case, uh, if that were necessary, and so on. And through that, and through those sorts of programs, you, be, you can begin to alleviate poverty, which surely has to be also not the only maybe, but certainly one of the main planks in an aid program. And it has to be so when you think about the fact that about 50% of the poorer people in the world, oh, sorry, of the poorer people in the world, they spend about 50% of their income on food. And uh, although we eat a lot more than them in Australia, or eat a lot more in Australia, we spend a lot less than 50% of our income on food. So in improving that agricultural productivity is an effective way to increase production for all the good reasons and reduce poverty. And increased productivity will build the local economies and of course that in itself is an, another effective plank in the platform that you're constructing to reduce poverty. So in Australia we've shown some leadership by sharing that expertise as I've said before and we've done so over a long time. We've established strong links and capabilities in delivering technology to developing countries in our region. And a good example, and not the only good example, but one good example is, is with East Timor, the Seeds of Life program, which was uh, jointly funded through East Timor's Ministry for Agriculture and Fisheries and the Australian Government through uh, the Australian Centre for Agricultural Research. The program started in the year 2000, has tested 210 varieties of staple crops on experimental stations before moving them to on-farm trials engaging Timorese farmers. And the gain from higher yielding varieties is sufficient to feed a thousand farming families a year, every single year. 
And of those farmers, more than half sold a third of their surplus, helping their families by buying more protein-enriched food and paying for their children's education. So it's a simple but effective indication, example of how research around food security and around food brings benefits beyond food. And as the US Secretary of Agriculture said recently, there's tremendous opportunity to provide solutions through shared capacity building tools. Greater access to these tools will allow farmers and ranchers around the world to produce more, increase access to food, and ultimately provide ladders of opportunity with improved incomes for people in rural communities around the world. And so the East Timor example is not just about us being a good neighbour, it is about also showing that Australian agricultural science expertise can join in a broader international movement of nations that do well in this discipline and share that expertise. Yet, uh, despite all the uh, research success we can talk about so far, and we rarely talk about the things that didn't work, but, but despite all that research success, there are challenges ahead. And one of the biggest, of course, is sustainability. This has been recognised at the most prominent national level and was contained in a report to the, in 2010 to the Prime Minister's Science, Engineering and Innovation Council. The report outlined four new challenges that need to be addressed in order for Australia to move towards sustainable practices. Maintaining the quality of our land, water and biological resources, ensuring threats to biosecurity are addressed, adapting to climate change and dealing with increases in outputs, uh, in input costs, sorry. All of those uh, will require science, especially the biological sciences, to provide some of the answers and all of those need at least some of you to play your part. Australian researchers are already investigating new ways to improve our resource management practices. Last year I was asked to speak at a soil security symposium, a relatively new area of research focused specifically on managing soil to support agricultural ecosystems and some of our politicians have actually declared that along with water, uh, our people and all the rest of it, soil is one of our great assets if we use it properly. Similarly, crop protection and biotechnology solutions are finding ways to increase yield while reducing water consumption and increasing a crop's nutrient uptake. Another challenge, the relentless threat of invasive species, for example, pests and weeds and disease, is already being countered by science. Herbicides, insecticides and fungicides are currently relied upon to increase global food production by between 30 and 50%. But of course if we use them we need to know whether they are safe or that they are safe. We need to know whether they leave undesirable, unreasonable residues. Indeed whether they have undesirable consequences for the ecosystems as a whole. And all of that actually requires science and it requires research and it requires understanding. So finally facing the challenges to our environment and to weather patterns, even if we don't know the extent of them, is already a huge part of our scientific research base. We are faced with the reality that many current farming processes and crops will be at risk in that changing environment. Those risks include things like longer droughts and more of them, increasing salinity in arable land, which is now predicted to treble from around about 7% to somewhere up to close to 18 or 19% of our arable land will be salt degraded by the middle 2020s unless we do something. We're seeing soil degradation, water scarcity, declining availability of fertilisers, emergence of pests and diseases in places where they were not previously found. So the solutions that science offers us could include better land management, better water management, better irrigation systems, more precision farming, as many farmers now do, using remote sensors and GPS, Sensitively conducted research into genetically modified crops and recycling of soil nutrients in, in food production. The development of biofertilisers and biopesticides might help reduce our dependence on their chemical cousins. And nanotechnology properly applied might be applied to control the timing and amount of any fertiliser used. So science offers agriculture possibilities as exciting as they are broad and as necessary as they are. It's estimated that close to a billion people in the world are malnourished right now. It's estimated that a million people go to sleep every night hungry. And with the population expected to grow from the present seven, of which one billion is malnourished, to nine billion by 2050, it's important for all of us to be investing in agricultural R&D, especially when you consider the lag before any benefits are seen. 
But I guess that I have to say that R&D investment on its own will not be enough. We need the people who are going to do the research. So it's not just about money, it's money to support the people, the right people, in the right place, with the right skills and at the right time. So as many of you sit here this morning wondering how to plot your pathway to further study and a career, I should say parenthetically, don't follow mine. Um, not because I've not enjoyed my career, but it's never been plotted or planned. Um, but uh, as you think about what you're going to do, it is indeed worth considering agricultural science. It's a discipline that needs good people and it offers the opportunity to do some good, real public good, real tangible, palpable public good, not just here in Australia but overseas as well. So regardless of whether you pursue agricultural science or another discipline, you should all know that you're an important part of Australia's total scientific enterprise and this country is better off for your participation and it will be better off for your effort. So I thank you for that, I thank you for the potential and I urge you to keep going. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. So Brock Charlton has expressed a willingness to entertain questions. Uh, Not about the black eyed peas. <laughs> so let me go over. Uh, can you fellow loudly? Thanks. Chuck, thank you for your, for your thought. Um, I, just, I, just, I see too many New South Wales um, a huge conflict between energy production and food production, coal seam gas, tail gas, production. I'm wondering what advice you have been given as they asked to give to the government on that conflict. Um, I haven't been asked to give any, um, and, uh, but I expect that I will be. Uh, we're about to release a port on uh, um, what we call, or what is being called unconventional gas, shale. Um, and shale is different from coal seam because it's much deeper, it's spread out across Australia in a different pattern, largely under underpopulated areas and so on. Uh, but it is, uh, so it's a potential energy resource. The industry is nascent, so there's a chance to get into baseline ecosystem studies and so on to get all the information available before uh, it, it uh, at least may become a, a bigger industry. But I think that the key or one of the elements in the report, which we ourselves did not do but had researched for us, uh, is that basic conflict between agricultural usage and and energy demands and uh, it's particularly focused in New South Wales for various reasons but it's also a national issue and I think it is going to be an issue where we have to get and make serious consideration about you know what what is potentially unless properly and well managed and well understood a real conflict between the, the um, uh, you know use of what would be otherwise arable agricultural land uh, for the purposes of providing the energy requirements of the country. And uh, it's, not, it's not an intractable problem, but it's a problem that's got to be worked at and, and uh, managed. And I think we're some distance away from doing that properly yet. If I could just add a footnote to that, um, it, it actually is the case that the uh, Professor Johnson Krill at Mary O'Kane, who's Chief Scientist of New South Wales, has been asked to do a report on, on that exact conflict that they're mm -hmm. currently working on. It. Uh, next. Thank you very much. I'm interested in, in the demand for food versus shaping or providing for the demand for food versus shaping the demand for food in terms of you know, eating more clever types of food that are actually more sustainable and easier to grow. Where, where do you see the food affect that? Um, well, I think we have to, because I don't think there's one simple, single solution to the sort of dilemma that confronts us. So, so it's not just about saying, um, you know, let's produce more hamburgers. It's about producing nutritious food that we're prepared to eat. Um, so I can think of a lot of nutritious food that I would never let inside my mouth um, yet, but I, maybe my grandchildren will have to. Uh, so it's, it's, there are, and it goes back a bit to what I was saying earlier about how 
Um, science doesn't work in isolation, it works within a community, according to community mores, uh, works with a social license, if you like. But what you have to do is to get the community to understand that there is this sort of social license and some of those changes are going to be necessary uh, in order to um, you know, sustain our way of life, population, whatever it might be. So I think we do have to make a fair bit of effort in changing what we eat, eating smarter as it were, because the knock-on co consequences of that are quite substantial with respect to health care and you know, future sort of conditions of life. Um, but we've also got to accommodate the fact that uh, we need more. And so we need more of the food that people are willing to eat. So you close the loop by saying we've got to get people to understand that what they used to think is a staple diet may no longer be. I mean, when I was growing up, um, you know, lamb chops and mashed potato is what you got. You didn't get it for breakfast, but you got it for nearly everything else. Um, and Australian eating patterns have changed, and, and, and some of it a lot for the better, some not so, so good. Um, you've all heard the fact that, you know, what was the figure? Some 60% of the food in the Western world is wasted because we prepare more than we eat or we don't eat all that we prepare. Um, so I think there is a, you know, a, a range of complex issues we've got to get to terms with, one of them which one of which is adapting diets as well as adapting our capacity to produce the food that's in those diets. Um, well, I think you go for truth every time. I think it's my job. Um, people may not always want to hear what you've got to say, uh, but I think uh, I, I think good scientists have a value set, a set of principles that, by and large, they do everything they can to abide by. If you have a value set that says that you value evidence, that you value observation, you value scepticism in science because it's how we progress, all of those sorts of things. But at the core of this, what you're trying to do is improve and understand better the evidence that's in front of you. Then, then I think that you've got you've to live by that, whatever the position it is that you happen to hold. And so I, um, uh, I don't think that I would... Um, I know that I would not hesitate from telling politicians about the evidence that they needed to develop good public policy. What I can't do is I can't then guarantee that they will listen uh, or take that advice. So I guess when you look back on it, then you work out a method to do that. I said when I... In, in fact, this is my second birthday in this job today, so when I get back we're having a... Uh, uh, my... The younger staff are feeding me black-eyed peas in vindaloo sauce, I think. Um, the two things I really love. Um, the, uh, uh, but during, during that period, you know, you, you sit back, you reflect and you look at these things. And, and as I said at the beginning, some of what I say will be public, some of what I will say will be private, because there's no point shouting at politicians so that you pretend you've got some sort of groundswell of opinion and they'll be publicly embarrassed into a position. What they're much more interested in is how strong is the evidence that's behind what you're saying to us and if you bring that forward then you stand a better chance of winning the argument. As I said, they won't always take your advice. You can get disappointed with that. Um, they, uh, but they've paid me to be an independent 
stressed several times in various forms and bits and pieces, an independent advisor to government about issues related to science. So I'm not an expert in everything. In fact, there would be some who would argue that I'm not an expert in anything anymore. Um, but, but I'm not an expert in everything. But I know where the expertise is. And I've got to rely on them. But I also have to honour their expertise. So if they say to me, I think this is what's going to happen and this is the evidence and this is the outcome that's predicted unless we, don't, you know, unless we do something and so on, I can't filter and massage that. I've got to take that and, and own it. Uh, own the advice and defend the expertise. So I'm not going to say it's easy. I'm not going to say there are some times when I don't think, um, you know, I wish they wouldn't ask me about that uh, or I hope they don't ask me about that. But if they do, you've got to rely on your principles, your values and the evidence and you don't flinch. My <laughs> question is that the glitches that they land in Australia's coordinate of the agriculture officer and the belief to the data lights. So how much emphasis is placed on doing research and providing support for future climate change and natural hazards and the stresses that these place on infrastructure and local markets and so on? How much emphasis right now or potential future? Embedded. Um, so, well, probably the best answer I can give you to that is that uh, we, we have produced for the government uh, strategic research priorities. And what we've tried to do is completely different from what we've done before, uh, which was to ask people what they did. If enough of them did something, we called it a priority. And that group was happy because they could tick a box on a grant form and say they worked to a national priority. And I don't think that overstates the usefulness of those priorities at that time. Um, we've taken a different approach and said, look, there are some great challenges that confront Australia, most of which relate to challenges that confront the world. Um, and we've got to make sure that we invest, that the public funding invested in trying to solve, manage, mitigate, adapt to whatever those challenges has got to be behind issues that are of critical importance right now. So, for example, one of the challenges that we've identified, and the government has signed off on the five, and I should say that if you look at the words of the European Union, you look at the words in the US, the grand challenges are very similar. We're all worried about security, personal as well as, you know, cyber attack and so on. We're all worried about food and water. We're all worried in some form or other. We're all worried about it. So one of ours is Adapt, uh, living in a changing environment. And there are three research priorities under that, which I hope the government will release. They've approved them, but they haven't released them yet. Um, uh, and I'm hoping they'll be released in the next couple of weeks. One of them uh, does look at how do we manage sustainably our assets to cope with the changing environment, some of which is through climate change, some of which is through or the consequences of climate change, increasing sea level, te uh, sea um, ocean temperatures, increasing atmospheric temperatures, change rainfall patterns. I mean, have a look at the Bureau of Meteorology rainfall maps over 50 years and look how it's shifted inexorably towards the northwest. All of those things will require us to do things differently, and we regard research in those areas as a critical strategic priority for Australia right now. Now there will be people disappointed that their particular little patch of research is not included in one of these priorities. Um, and I'm not going to say that what they do isn't important. I am going to say that there are, of all the important things, some things just more important right now. And so our hope is that the consequence of the adoption of these research priorities is that the Prime Minister authorises me on her uh, behalf to go to federal funding agencies, departments and agencies, um, 
and say to them, a proportion of your budget has got to be spent in these priority areas. Show me how you do it. Now, some of them will be already, because we already do work on water, um, and they fund it. Uh, the question is whether we do enough, whether we've got the pipeline of students coming through to continue and maintain that activity in a sustainable way. And built into all of these arguments, although it's not written into every sentence, but built into the notion behind all these arguments is sustainability. So there is money spent now. I couldn't tell you how much and I couldn't tell you precisely on what because we're now finding that out because part of the thing is to say to the, to the government of the day, this is a strategic research priority. This is what we already do and we don't do enough here or here or we do a lot there and that's really good or we've got a lot of undergraduate students coming through the pipeline to lead into this area of, uh, of research and development and that's fine, or we don't and so we should do something about making sure we encourage undergraduates to go into that area. So it, it, it's going to be a more complex response to research priorities than previously, but hopefully much more effective in focusing attention on the critical areas that we need where we need research to be done right now. Yeah. Well, um, I understand that the New South Wales Rugby League team is called the Cockroaches, so <laughs> maybe we could just send them off. <laughs> uh, no, well, of course there is. I mean, but I did say that there were some things that I wouldn't put inside my mouth. Um, I remember once being served a plate of deep-fried scorpions, and I and I couldn't uh, I couldn't bring myself to look at this little hook and think that I could chew it. But my colleagues did, and they were just crunchy um, and and probably nutritious. So yes, there are. I mean, I I think it is a question of the sort of shape of the food that we eat, uh, the nature of the food we eat, where. The, the, the primary objective is to provide probably enjoyable but certainly certainly nutritional uh, food. And so um, what they would be and, and how you would develop them and what would be the food value of what you develop uh, is not something uh, I could talk about sensibly with you right now. But the principle is uh, certainly a good one, that, that we do have to think about what we eat and how we produce what we eat and the value of what we eat uh, in nutritional terms. And uh, I wouldn't think that there's too much off the agenda right now because, you know, if our population as a global, uh, as a planet does grow to 9 billion by 2050 and we can't already adequately feed 7, we're going to have to do things differently and a lot better than we do now. So I think you put it on the table and you take things off because the consequences are too adverse, the, the, the dangers are too great, whatever it might be, and you're left with a collection of things that, that will not be the same as, uh, as what we have today, and then the ones you pursue. Terrific. Thanks very much. We okay. Have to move on. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, we have to move on, vacate the room, sadly. Um, as you can tell, that. The punchline is that the Australian countryside is going to be remade over the next 50 years, over the generation of your working lives. And one way or the other, <coughs> you have the opportunity to shape how that will be. Will you join me in thanking Professor Chubb very much indeed? <laughs>